Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Nostalgia Trap Podcast. My name is David Parsons. I'm happy that you are listening to the show. I hope you're enjoying these conversations. Uh, my guest today is Owen Powell. Owen Powell is uh, a veteran of the war in Iraq. He is uh, a, a, a retired form, former U.S. Marine uh, and former p- military police sergeant. Um, his experiences in the U.S. military over the course of the last couple decades are incredible. Um, he was nice enough to invite me over to his house in Queens. We sat in his kitchen, and he told me a whole lot of stuff uh, about war. Uh, so if you're into war, and I mean into war in terms of uh, 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 every all the complexities of that experience, uh, um, and and for, you know the, the 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 highs, lows, and the the, the tragedies in between. Um, Owen Powell has some some uh, amazing insights into that experience, um, and it was great to listen to. This is a long episode. This is a heavy episode. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get something out of it. I think it's absolutely vital uh, that we start coming to terms with what warfare is in this country, um, and I think uh, Owen has a lot to say about that. Um, so I hope you enjoy this. This is uh, uh, another episode of The Nostalgia Trap. You can find lots more on iTunes. You can go to Stitcher.com. You can go to nostalgiatrap.libsyn.com uh, and of course if you find Nostalgia Trap on Facebook and like the page you'll get updates on new episodes and all sorts of other stuff. I hope you enjoy this episode. Um, this was a, a, a real treat to be able to listen to uh, a, a combat veteran of, of our recent wars uh, coming to terms with his experiences. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. This is me talking to Owen Powell. I guess first of all, I should probably do a quick introduction. Right, yeah, for, yeah. For the for the listeners. Sure. Uh, my name is Owen R. Powell. Uh, Forty-seven. Um, I'm retired military. Um, I spent sixteen years on active duty in the army as a military police soldier. Mm. And then before that, oh, I'm sorry. Is this me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Go ahead. Your coffee. We're getting the coffee situation straight. Right. And I also spent four plus years in the Marine Corps on active duty, where I was an aviation crash fire rescue technician. Mm. Uh, I say four plus because I I got out and I was in 85 to 89, got out. 91, I got called back for Desert Storm, mm. which was an interesting experience in itself. Um, yeah, we, we we can get to we can get to that for sure. Yeah. But uh, um, how did you, I, I don't often hear a lot of uh, a lot of stories of, of people going between branches like yeah. that. Is, that. is that something that's that's common? It it is fairly common actually, um, and uh, civilians sometimes have a hard time wrapping their head around it. Um, <laughs> federal service is federal service, regardless of you know who you work for. Mm. So you know if you had six years uh, in the Marine Corps and then you know. 20 years in the CIA mm. it all counts as federal service right? yeah yeah um, so what you often get is folks that jump between branches of service um, and the one that's very common is funnily enough the same as mine which was guys that join the Marines and they do that for a while and the Marine Corps is awesome in many ways but it's a very Spartan life right mm. and so most people in most branches of services, you know, do their initial tour and then they get out. Right? Yeah. They're done. You right. Know, they, they, they've done their time. But for a lot of people, including myself, is c- civilian life isn't always very satisfying. Mm-hmm. And you miss the shared purpose and sense of mission that everybody has, you know, in the service, particularly the camaraderie. And so you end up going back in. But <laughs> for Marines, what it sometimes goes is, you're like, dude, I don't really want to do deal with the Marine Corps bullshit, right? Yeah. So you end up joining the next closest thing, which, of course, is the Army, mm. right? The Army is more than twice, well, according to manning levels, you know, it can be as much as four times the size of the Marine Corps. Jesus. And so it has a vastly larger budget right mm-hmm. and so the standard of living is often mm. easier mm-hmm. and the sort of um, 
corporate mindset of the Army is very different from the Marines. And that can be good in many ways. And as I found out, it can also be extremely frustrating in many mm. ways. And so it's not uncommon to see guys, you know, that uh, I've, I've also known a ton of guys that, you know, uh, joined the Army. I have some Ranger buddies of mine, right, who I work with in Korea doing, doing SWAT operations. Uh, I ran a special action team there for five years. Mm. Uh, and they had been Rangers, right, which is very, very elite within the Army, and done their time, got out, and joined the Air Force, <laughs> right, because the really one of the best standards of living out of all the branches of services, the Air Force. Mm. Right? Air Force budget is through the roof, and, and their whole modus operandi is very, very different than the Marine Corps and the Army. So, yeah, that stuff happens quite a bit. And even in my last unit, which was uh, Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, yeah. Which a lot of people don't realize is an active dar- duty Army base. Um, at one point, we had three former Marines, you know, in my tiny little military police detachment, mm. you know. Uh, so, yeah, not too uncommon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, when you, were, when you were growing up, and you never told me where you grew up, <laughs> yeah. but, but when you were growing up, I mean, what, what, was, what was your relationship to military matters? I mean, how did, the, how did you kind of evolve to the point where you're joining the military? How did that happen for you? Well, it's because I was born into the military. My, my dad was a, a fighter pilot mm. in the Air Force, all right? And he flew F-4s for most of his career. And then he was a staff officer for a long time in England. And uh, then he was an instructor pilot flying T-38s. And so from day one, literally, you know, I was, I was in the military. And, not, and granted, being a dependent is not the same as being in the service, but that same aspect of shared mission you know, very tightly knit community that at the same time was absolutely transitory and transient. Yeah, yeah. was a big factor of growing up. So the longest that I ever lived in one place growing up was four years at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Mm. Ohio, right? Most of the time, uh, we'd be at a place for two years, three years, and then move. Now, that presents a really interesting... uh, dynamic for military kids because what you tend to find is that people either become sort of social gadflies right where they are extremely (laughs) quick at making friends and sort of um, adjusting to the new environment and running with it Um, on the other hand what you get is kids that never really figure it out right and so are quiet introverts Mm. and that was that was me for a long time um it was also interesting because my my mother is British, and um, a very different, a certain kind of British too comes from a very unusual family, the Visics, sort of upper middle class, but had built up through trade industries, and <laughs> all of all of the Visics are are half insane, uh, so you know they all. Uh, ride motorcycles and sail and climb mountains and blow things up. And, and actually, my childhood, there was a, a huge degree of blowing things up. <laughs> so some of my favorite memories were that the, the, the Visics had a, a bit of land, which they called simply, you know, in quotation marks, the land. Yeah, yeah. And this was in Sussex, and it was um, some fields and um, a really beautiful stretch of woods. And so, as a child in England, and this is the other part, is that because my mom was British and because there's a lot of Air Force installations in Britain, my childhood kept flip-flopping between the States and England. Okay. Right? And back in the days where it was not ungodly expensive to fly across the Atlantic, even when we're, we weren't there, we generally had summers there as a kid. So, my childhood was usually around my crazy grandfather and uncles um, doing things like we would have huge family picnics in the woods and we'd create these giant bonfires and at some point an uncle would insert uh, like a compressor tank full of oxyacetylene <laughs> gas into the middle of the bonfire and then we would yeah. hide behind the trees and wait for the fireball to you know, roll out of the <laughs> woods. <laughs> And I have a feeling that may have had something to do with my decision to join the Marines. 
<laughs> well, well, I can imagine that. I mean, there is there is a certain degree of uh, yeah adventure uh, tied to tied to that kind of stuff. I mean, you when, bet. when you were um, when this was happening, was this like the Vietnam era? Is this uh, is it, it around was, that yeah. era? I I, yeah. I wonder because if your dad's in the military during this time, what's yeah. his what's his experience, and and, well, and how are you kind of conceiving of it? Yeah, and there's a there's a huge connection here in my life, and you know, and, and in the book about exactly that um what's your book called before we forget oh the the, the book that's coming out here uh, next year early next year is uh called objective rally point objective rally point yeah, yeah i've seen that online yeah and that's that that's my facebook name mm-hmm. yeah you know and there's actually a lot behind that which we can talk about later on sure um but yeah, that that time was 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 during the Vietnam War, and in fact, some of my earliest recollections were um, l- living in Eastbourne while my dad was in Southeast Asia, mm. and so he did two tours. He did what was it? I believe it was sixty nine, seven, seventy, and seventy seventy one. Mm. Right. Um, the first tour was as the the Gib in an F4, a GIB, the guy in back, <laughs> which is what the Air Force calls the uh, navigators, right? Um, and then he went back the next year so he could be the uh, pilot in command, you know, the guy in the front. And this is the prime time of Nixon's bombing campaign. This is when the, the, the war shifted from the, the kind of ground jungle war that we, we think of in the movies to uh, almost almost entirely bombing. I think the, the ground war was done and that, by, and that by was, 69 or something like that. Yeah, and that was largely my dad's function. Uh, he was assigned to uh, squadrons out of Yu Dorn and Yu Ban in Thailand. Mm-hmm. And so the vast majority of the stuff they were doing was supporting the B-52 raids headed north across Laos, you know, and also a tremendous amount of stuff focusing on uh, um, not really close air support, but very, but, but tactical support um, and suppression along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yeah, yeah. So, and the F-4 was really good for that, you know, it was designed to be a fighter bomber. Mm. Um, did you talk about the war with your dad yeah, during this time? Well, yeah. I mean, what was his attitude towards it? I mean, because uh, the war in our memory now is just this like enormously like contentious thing. Um, yeah. But 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 you know, you get a different view of it when you're when you're talking to the people that are on the inside of it that are actually fighting the war. What was that? What was that like at your house? As a child, there really wasn't any discussion. I mean, I, when during those two tours, I was four and five, okay. possibly yeah. six years old. It's uh, hard to get into the complex politics at yeah, that time. Exa- exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, you know, like most memories that come from that point in your childhood, it, it's it's snapshots. And the one that's very, very clear, there's there's two very clear snapshots that come out of that. And one is my mother sitting on the stairs at our little house in Eastbourne. And um, she's got my two younger brothers you know on either side of her and uh and she's 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 holding this letter and she's in tears and i'm standing there with sort of british suspender shorts Mm -hmm. you know and a a, a blonde um bowl cut um having no idea what to do and so i did the only thing which i could think of which is i went and got her a glass of water huh and what had happened, and this is the type of thing where you fill in the blanks, you know, decades later, is that on my on his second tour, my dad didn't write very often, um, probably for a number of reasons, which which I can understand really well. And so, Mum had gotten a rare letter from him, mm. and you know was was overwhelmed by it. The next memory that's very clear is it's nighttime and there's uh, same same house. Uh, there's the doorbell rings. And I open the door, and it's night outside and it's raining. And there's a guy standing there and he's wearing a brown leather jacket, mm-hmm. you know, flight jacket. And I had no fucking idea who he was. <laughs> None, you know. And after a bit of, of looking at my father, you know, I turned and, Mum, 
Yeah, yeah. You know, and and that was a defining moment for most of my life's experience with my dad. Mm. Because what happened after that, and this is very common to military families, is that, oh, well, this is your dad, right? And so um, dad tells you what to do, and you're like, oh, I don't know who you are. Yeah, you're out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So everything would, would go back to, you know, I'd, I'd ask my mom, you know, or look mm. at my mom, right? And so you can imagine the type of conflict that that would... It's really interesting considering that the man is invested in this authority as a military person, yes. and yet the mother is the real authority in the house. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And that 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 conflict um, just continued to, to rise for, for decades, mm, right? Mm -hmm. And so in high school where I was... Uh, you know, the, the strange kid with a British accent that didn't know what clothes to wear and uh, didn't fit in with anybody and so sort of gravitated towards the, the geek nerd slash punk rocker element. Yeah, yeah. Right? How that would then reverberate with my dad. And it's funny because I'm sitting, I'm sitting here now with a, with a mohawk. This is my, yeah. my newest... Um, <laughs> Uh, haircut and for years including in Iraq I, j I just shaved my head it was yeah. the easiest way to live um, and I fairly recently decided well you know I'm, I'm creating my reality <laughs> I have nothing to prove to anybody except for my wife and myself what haircut would I most like um, I'd like a mohawk <laughs> I couldn't have one at 17 right yeah so fuck it I'm gonna have a mohawk <laughs> yeah and, and you know the mohawk has such like a, a particularly like a uh, American resonance in like many different ways you know yeah. it's got I mean it's got like the counterculture punk rock thing but it's also got like the Native, Native American. American like warrior yeah. thing I also think of Travis Bickle and yeah, a taxi absolutely. driver taxi right yeah. Uh, yeah. so it's got a New York thing as yes. well like yes. uh, no it's a really and resonant it, haircut and for me it goes back even further because when I wear it you know what I, I don't think of it as a mohawk i think of it as a spartan right? yeah yeah it's the spartan right. uh you know headdress sure um yeah that helmet yeah exactly yeah and since my new identity post post military retirement you mm -hmm. know has come to be uh warrior mystic right mm -hmm. with the emphasis increasingly on mystic and not the warrior right um you're in a different phase of that evolution now. Yeah, and for me, it's been the central part of my consciousness change over the past 11 months, mm. 12 months now. Um, because I had a, what I've come to understand was a Kundalini awakening mm -hmm. in January of this year. Uh, it fits very well because it's like uh, I, a large part of what Objective Rally Point is about is, is it, you know, it's telling multiple stories at the same time. Mm. The primary story is the story of the, the last de combat deployment to Iraq that I did. The other primary story is the seven years of not addressing my PTSD. Mm. Right? Uh, the third story is it's the story of the, this Kundalini awakening and how that consciousness change has evolved. Right? Mm. And so I was faced with this problem where <clears throat> for a, a whole lot of very, very intense reasons, I was just raging out of control berserker you know and uh, I, I paid for that in many ways where you know, I paid for it in the the, my, the destruction of my first marriage mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and, and this I, is these are common military stories as well you bet yeah, yeah I, su super common I mean how, how far how long were you in the military before your first deployment to a, what you would call a wartime situation like when, when I mean I guess we do a little history like when did you join when did you first join well I first joined the Marines in 85 uh, did a lot of deployments then but you know no wars um, 91 was exciting because I got called back and, you know, was was flown out to uh, Camp Pendleton, California. Yeah. Uh, which was empty, except for a whole bunch of pregnant WMs, mm. you know, because everybody was over, everybody was in the Persian Gulf. Mm. And so we were told three days after getting there and we were, it was about 10,000 pissed off 
former Marine civilians, right, who showed up. All of us called back in voluntarily. None of us really wanted to be there. Mm. Um, and they're like, you are going to Iraq. Wow. You will be gone for at least a year. You are not your primary MOS. <laughs> you are now all O311. You are combat replacement company Marines. You are going to go in there and replace the thirty to 60,000 casualties that we were about to take. And we're like, <laughs> wow! Dude, I'd been, I, I'd been out for a year and a half at that point. Yeah, and and, and, uh, and you, so you have like all the you have ten thousand pissed off Marines. I mean, yes. that's kind of amazing to think about because I mean, you think of I think of Marines often as this like kind of there's so much mythology embedded in the yeah. Marine I, I, idea and the idea that that you know the Marines stand ever ready. They're an elite force that are so dedicated and so committed that whenever the call is put out, you know they're ready like Batman. You know to put on that put on that outfit and go but the, the picture you're painting is of a bunch of people that were out and are kind of like fuck well i'm pulled back in you know that that, that mythology is true that yeah. is how the marine corps is uh but you also get this stuff where it's like dude i did my time right 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 and um but then the marine corps is also very good about putting the uh the cerebral um blinders on very very quickly mm. and so and i remember that speech being given by a marine colonel and we were in this amphitheater in camp margarita you know on camp Pendleton, uh in the desert you know mountains in the background and from that we were marched straight to the barber shop and ah it's full it's, metal jacket yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's i think we were allowed to get high and tights you know so it wasn't a full recruit experience again but uh you know and for that first three days we were still in civilian clothes, mm. right? And so from the and then from the haircut, from you know, from the from the speech to the haircut, and then boom, put on your BDUs, you know, your utilities. It was real immediately. Yeah. yeah. And, and and the funny thing is, then almost instantly we were all, we were like, oh, all right, I'm back in Marine Corps mode. You know, uh, like you could switch that back on pretty quickly. Yeah, and more than that, the the switch was forced to be turned on. Yeah. Right. You know? And I mean, imagine there's something uh, uh, about everyone else around you putting on that same uniform at the same time, and there's something psychological going on with the you're camaraderie, right. which you're which you're talking about. And, we, and I've talked about this with yeah. on other episodes of the show, where it's kind of like that the 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 military machine, you know, however you conceive of that, really kind of um, you know plays off of that camaraderie really really cleverly, and and that the 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 especially in the post Vietnam War era the idea of the the mission itself is often you know for each other you know that that's what you're really there for is for each other and that the larger kind of political context is not something that you're involved in as much yeah that that's that's largely true that, although my experience in Iraq we did not give a fuck about mm -hmm. The mission, mm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we we did when we first got there, and of course we're like, all right, man, you know, and and a is lot. This, of, is this Iraq two thousand three, or is this? This is Iraq two thousand six. Two thousand six, okay. Yeah, because the weird thing was that I just happened to miss actual combat again and again and again. Yeah. So like the first time it happened was Panama. I uh, eat ETS out of the Marine Corps, you know, uh, December second, nineteen eighty five. Nineteen days later. Panama kicks off, right? Uh -huh. And my unit, MWSS 273, went. Yeah. So I'm like, man, I just missed it, you know? <laughs> were you were you itching for combat? Are you one of those guys? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And this, here's the thing is that um, most soldiers and Marines are. Most service members are, right? Mm -hmm. um, particularly if you're not very bright. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, part of that, a huge part of that, is just that you're young, yeah. right? And the yeah. way the Marine Corps works is you come out of Paris Island or San Diego, out of boot camp, you know, believing that you are immortal, yeah, that you can do anything, you are going to live forever, and you're bulletproof and everything else. Um, and the problem is that with tactical training and everything, and trained very realistically for years, and this was more true for me, funnily enough, in the Army than it was in the Marine Corps. In the Marine Corps, I was a firefighter, right? You know, aviation firefighter. In the Army, I was military police, which has a combat role that most civilians don't realize, right? Mm. You're essentially mobile infantry. Mm. Um, so the tactical training, just because of the job, was very, very different 
in the army and much much more tactical than than when I was in the Marines. Yeah. Um, very quickly after getting Iraq to Iraq, it became obvious that the, the, the mission was bullshit. It was essentially undoable. Mm. Which the mission for my company initially was to work with the Iraqi National Police um, and with the checkpoints that they were running in Baghdad. And our area of operations specifically was the east side of Baghdad. So if you look at an overhead, a satellite map of Baghdad, you get this big oval, you know, you have the Euphrates that curls through it, right? Tigris, Euphrates, mm. Tigris, Tigris. Mm. I don't, I always get the damn rivers. And stuff. <laughs> anyway, if you look at the, the, that big, you know, metropolitan sprawl of Baghdad, you'll see that on the right hand side, there's a giant gash mm. that is cut straight through the city and that that dividing line it, it what we called it was the the official designation was msr pluto you know, the iraqis called it the old army canal road and this is a divided double highway that goes straight through the city mm. uh, so if you look at a map it's very very evident so this gives you an idea that route pluto when we started off was our area of operations and so the Iraqi National Police, which is this bizarre, super heavily armed sort of paramilitary federal law enforcement unit, it's, it's a stopgap between the actual Iraqi army and the, the Iraqi police, or what we always refer to them as IPs. Now, IPs are, the, or your, are cops, yeah. standard cops. Right? So the Iraqi National Police is this weird paramilitary thing that's in between. And so what we would do is we'd go down, out on these patrols and we'd pull up to these checkpoints that they would run, which were on the bridges, all the bridges that spanned Route Pluto. Um, and we would, my squad leader would ask them um, questions from a questionnaire. It was the same questions, same questionnaire, every patrol, every day. And some of the questions are just just ridiculous how do you feel about coalition forces yeah. <laughs> are your toilets working properly you know yeah <laughs> um uh, do you agree strongly agree disagree <laughs> strongly disagree most of it was about logistics though and the problem is it was painfully obvious that their logistics were terrible yeah right? yeah and so we we'd fill out the questionnaires and we'd send them up but n almost nothing would change mm. you know um and then the second half of that deployment, we were actually, we were doing PPT where we were working with the Iraqi police. So now we were going to police stations. We'd provide training for them. We would sometimes patrol with them. Uh, and we were sort of the whole interface, the local interface between the occupying force, you know, co coalition force, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Iraqi police. What was really frustrating about that is it also almost nothing would change with them, and it be eventually became apparent that they were the bad guys, mm, mm -hmm. right? That they were the Mekdi army, right? Mm -hmm. And the Mekdi army was my company's primary adversary, uh, and this is a, a, a Shiite force, uh, not an army at all. Uh, it's an insurgent group. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was headed by Muqtadr al-Sadr, who's this Islamic Shia cleric that essentially controlled um, all of the Shia in Baghdad. And, and actually, quite beyond that, further south, too. And he's gone, right? Al-Sadr, if I remember? Or is he still, oh, he's is he still, still there? He's still there? I, th I thought the U.S. got him. No, no. Because the whole thing about Sadr is that he was not, you know, a terrorist, right? He's, he's a cleric. Mm. Now he is running it, uh, essentially a terrorist, you know, or insurgent army at the time. Had a tremendous amount of uh, power, so much so that all over eastern Baghdad, there's um, big billboards on the side of the road, right? Professionally yeah. done. Yeah. And they would have uh, very often you would see a, pic a big picture of a bearded Islamic guy, you know, big white beard, older, you know, and then a picture of a younger fat guy, you yeah, know, with a black beard, right? And so the, the, the fat kid is Muqtadr al-Sadr, mm, and yeah, the old yeah. guy is Muhammad al-Sadr, who is his father, who was really, really revered mm. you know, as a great cleric. 
And so Muki, as some of our interpreters would call him derisively, Muki is essentially running on his father's coattails. And, you know, so the police, you know, became apparent were just another aspect of the Mekdi army. Yeah, right. Um, can, can I ask you, you know, when you're, when you're in Iraq in 2006, you're, you're older than a lot of the people that a lot of the yeah. Americans are there. Like, yeah. What was the relationship? A lot of my soldiers yeah, well, I mean, what was the relationship like? Uh, between between you and uh, the the younger soldiers that were there, I should say soldiers and marines are two different two different people, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, they, yeah, these guys are soldiers. Yeah. They, um, well, it was strange because I had started off as their squad leader. Yeah. Right? So all the initial train up that we did in in Germany. I was in Germany because at the time I was stationed in Germany, right? And what a lot of Americans don't realize is that we still have a fairly large presence, military presence in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, about 30,000 folks, uh, compared to 130,000 folks back before the Iron Curtain came down. Um, so I had trained these guys up and then had been replaced by a more senior NCO who was a blithering freaking idiot. Mm -hmm. Uh, literally a lisping, drooling idiot. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Well-meaning, but just way in over his head. Um, so, I was, I think, you'd have to ask them, right? Most of them are on my, my, my Facebook. Most of the soldiers, you know, we're still <laughs> yeah. f friends with. Yeah. And so I was generally re regarded, I think, as a semi-crazy, but really smart, really tactically, you know, proficient guy mm -hmm. that put a tremendous amount of energy into training, right? And because of my previous military experience, one with the Marine Corps, yeah. right, meant that I was very, very aggressive. Yeah. And because of running the special reaction team, which I did in, you know, Korea for five years, and I was on a SRT before that at Fort, Fort Riley, you know, as a team member, uh, I was really, really big on um, special operations tactics, yeah. right? A lot of that came up from a fresh, uh, an even earlier experience where I was briefly in a reserve special forces unit in Ohio, not tabbed, right? And I, it's got to be really, really clear about this because most of the time when I hear veterans talk about, oh, I have special forces, right? They're full of shit, yeah. right? I am not, wasn't tabbed, mm -hmm. not special forces certified, but I was lucky enough to serve as a support soldier mm -hmm. in an SF unit. Um, and I was on this training team within C Company 2nd Battalion, 11th Special Forces Group, before 11th Group was deactivated. And that was very formative for me. I was also really lucky that I got to be stationed at places often in very, very close proximity with Special Forces. And so, like, my first tour in Germany, I was at Panzerkasern outside of Stuttgart, where the 1st and 10th Special Forces Group is at, right? And there's, also, there's also a Navy SEAL contingent mm -hmm. there. And I knew these guys because I skydived with them, right? Skydived for years, and I also was really into uh, personal tactical shooting. And so I would shoot with these guys a lot. And so my focus has always been to try to make whatever I'm doing as close to special forces as possible, mm -hmm. you know? And the obvious question that comes out of this is, you know, the listener would say, well, well why didn't you go to special forces then, right? <laughs> and well, I did uh, when I was in Korea. I went to SFAS, which is Special Forces Assessment and Selection School, and it's in Camp McCall, which is a sort of outlying installation near Fort Bragg. Um, and I went with two very good friends of mine from the SRT in Korea, right, the, with the 728th MP Battalion. Um, went with this guy, a very, very good friend of mine even today, uh, Kevin Bloom, and also um, James Bartholomew, mm -hmm. who was one of my team NCOs. Mm -hmm. um, Bloom got picked up, he got selected, and Bart and I did not. Um, and anybody that goes to selection knows that that's how it goes, right? In my case, I couldn't run fast enough. Yeah. You know? and, I, and I had also realized that by then that Special Forces' focus was very, very different than it was when I had been in the uh, Reserve SF unit, right? In those days, and the old focus of Special Forces was very much on foreign internal defense and unconventional warfare. And it's still, its focus is 
unconventional warfare mm-hmm. to a certain degree. What it really is nowadays mostly focused on is direct action, right? right? Which is very, very different, which means that you're not going over there to train up guerrillas, you know, and then lead them or direct them in combat, right? You're actually going there to hit targets. Mm-hmm. And that's a notable, notable difference between like special forces and the ranger regiment. Rangers are all about that. That's all they do is direct that. Right, right, right. SF used to be much more focused on quiet behind the scenes, small unit tactics, unconventional warfare, stuff like that. So with that change in mission uh, focus, it meant that the type of person they were looking for was very different. Yeah. And so I went to SFAS when I was, what, like 37, mm. which already is really, really late to go. Um, and it was clear that they wanted super young, super fit guys, didn't care if they had had overseas experience working with foreign troops, mm-hmm. which I had ex- you know, extensive experience in that, and that works really well for UW, but they wanted guys that super, super fit. Yeah. And so that's why Kevin got selected, the guy was a machine, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, I was too old and too slow, and so I did my time in the hut of shame, <laughs> as they <laughs> call it, you know, and went home and said... You, 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 yeah, you're, you, you're just too old. Yeah. So I think for the soldiers is that because I had tried to instill as much of that focus into uh, the, the, the train up as possible, um, you know, with a big inf- influ- uh, focus on mount operations, military operations, urban terrain, you know, yeah. building yeah. clearing, room clearing. I was really big on teaching call for fire. And then we got this other squad leader. And a platoon sergeant who was also just a freaking idiot. And every time I would suggest that stuff after that, he'd go, oh, you're, we're never going to do that. <laughs> well, we turned out to do all of that stuff yeah. again and again and again. Um, so, yeah, it was a combination of Sergeant Powell's semi out of his skull, and uh, but he knows what he's doing. And the biggest thing is that he really, really cares about the about the welfare of the soldier, right? And mm-hmm. welfare of the soldier includes the tactical training. I wanted to make sure my guys had as many skills as possible in order to keep themselves alive, number one, and also achieve the mission. Yeah. Well, that was not the way things work downrange. And my book, essentially, is all about leadership failure, right? Mm. And, and that includes my own failure, mm. you know? Because... <sighs> Without giving too much of the book away, what it, what it comes up to is an increasing number of very, very close calls with death, uh, and then ultimately turning the gun on myself mm. because I was trapped. Well, I mean, can we talk a little bit about that? I mean, I, without giving too much of the book away, I wanted to ask, I guess we, we had hit on this idea earlier that, like, the young feel this sense of, like, immortality, right? And, like, yeah. you, you go into, uh, um, oftentimes when you go into a, a military situation when you're, when you're young, you, you add the, 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 the immortality of youth with that indoctrination of the military, and you, you produce this person that has a very kind of di- distant relationship to death, but at the same time is cro- probably closer to it than most civilians. So, uh, you know, um, how, do, how did that happen for you? Did you feel that immortality? And, and was there a moment or was there a particular uh, uh, point where you felt that you weren't immortal anymore and that you felt like a fear? Or, yeah. Or, or, well, for most of my life, you know, I have tried to be the hero, right? Mm. Getting your mom a glass of water. And she's yeah, said, that's yeah, very good. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 you know? Uh, and, and that narrative is very strong in our culture, right? Is that we're always going to win the girl. Right? Mm-hmm. We're always going to defeat the evil demon. Mm. You know? uh, we're always going to ride to the rescue. And so I really based you know, my whole life on doing that. And skydiving was definitely part of that. Mm. You know? Scuba diving was definitely part of that. Uh, motorcycles, you know? um, tactical shooting, rock climbing, rappelling. Uh, and I believed in pushing the envelope as far as possible. And, and, you know, my favorite part of the military was running that SRT where we used to do crazy, crazy stuff, right? <laughs> um, it was Iraq that really, really, really bought, ended all of that. Mm. 
Now, and when you say end it all that, you mean like you're kind of like exhilaration and excitement and and sense of fun to, towards those things. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, but also the uh, the sense of immortality. Yeah, yeah. The single biggest event for that, and it was right before I was finally pulled out of Iraq, was uh, I got shot in the helmet by a sniper. Mm. Um, and the round actually came in through the front of my Peltor headphones and then out the side of the Peltor headphones and then through my ACH, my helmet, right? From oh. the inside out. Wow. But, you know, like a lot of blockheads and, 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 and uh, you know, very much in keeping with that initial Marine stuff, right? It's not just one event that does this to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. What really, really got me was, was 14 months of events, mm. right? And we were sort of in some ways eased into it in that um, it was several months before we t had anybody killed any of our guys killed and we first started losing people from snipers um, first guy was this kid named Remf which is funny in itself mm -hmm. it really was his name Remf the military folks will get that right because mm -hmm. this kid's name was spelled R E M P F, Remf. <laughs> yeah. It was very popular, it goes back to Vietnam days mm -hmm. of capital R E M F, right? Which means rear echelon motherfucker. Yeah, right? yeah, he's I have heard that. He's yeah, a Remf. soldier, an yeah. MP, and his name really is Remf. Remf. And he was, yeah. he was the first guy that was taken out. He wasn't killed, but he was a gunner on a Humvee. In, in my company, and he was shot in the side of the head by a sniper, uh, and it blew out his right eyeball, but didn't kill him, right? Jesus. So, <clears throat> so he got shot, and then we had a female MP get shot, also a gunner, and she was getting out of the out of the turret the wrong way. Instead of coming down through the turret on the inside of the vehicle, which is difficult when you're wearing full combat gear, yeah. right? Yeah. She did what a lot of folks used to do is just jump on top of the roof and then step down to the hood and then step down to the ground. And so, and she had done this on patrol and boom, got shot in the back by a sniper, right? Mm. Unfortunately, her ESAPI plate in her IBA, in her interceptor ballistic armor, stopped around, right? Mm. And I was fighting this weird battle with, with my freaking first sergeant, who's another pogue. Um, <laughs> Where I had bought, because, because I was a SWAT guy, first and foremost, right? I was what they call a geardo, right? I was a weirdo, mm -hmm. right? Who's really, really into gear. Um, I can actually pull up a picture of the ridiculous M4203 that I had that was just tricked out with all the bells and whistles, right? <laughs> so I had bought a ton of gear on my own, including a 10 power variable, uh, you know, mill dot reticle, dual illuminated sniper scope. <laughs> now, I was qualified as a, not as a sniper, but as a SRT marksman observer. I went to the school, it's a very difficult school, right? So I knew what I was doing with this stuff. And my first sergeant in Kuwait had seen this scope and had said, the commander actually liked it. This first sergeant was like, well, you can't have that. Well, why not, first sergeant? And yes, I was the type of the NCO who would. Why the fuck not, first yes. sergeant? Right. And he goes, because it's different. <laughs> so I'm like, so if I bought my own ACOG and put that on there, that would be okay. And he's like, yeah. <sighs> so we're in Iraq and we're getting right away. People start getting sniped. Yeah. So I'm like, fuck it. I broke out the scope and I put it on. And every time I got out of the truck, I would be glassing windows, glassing rooftops, looking for the sniper. You know. Um, and with my guys, I really push to put on the appearance that you are actively looking for the enemy yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so, like when we would do night patrol, we would roll down the the the, the street, and uh, we'd have la you know the green lasers going everywhere, constantly rooftops, windows. We'd have spotlights going back and forth. To you know, we'd have the. Uh, Gunners would be swiveling the, 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 the guns, the 50 cals, or the 240 bravos. So they put out the appearance that, hey, we are looking for you. Mm -hmm, and we're mm -hmm. going to light you up in a heartbeat, right? And it's one of the reasons why I think my particular squad did not take much sniper fire, right? 
um, which isn't to say that we didn't get shot at, mm. but um, this was in 2006 in Iraq. Yeah, 2006, yeah. 2007. Yeah, and was that was that your last um, combat deployment? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. To tell you the truth, I came back because of the way that things worked out. Um, I you know I was removed from theater three weeks after I took that sniper round through my head. Mm. Uh, I mean, when that happened to you, I mean, did you? How did how, did did people rush to your side? You know what I mean. What what was yeah. the? Were you knocked out? I wasn't knocked out. Uh, what had happened is that we were standing on a place called uh, ASR Rainier, alternate supply route Rainier. Right? Yeah. So this is a, a street. It's in Al Quds, which is uh, a Mahala. Mahala is a neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that's just north of Sadr City. Okay. Sadr City itself, a lot of people think that it's a city. It's not. It was uh, a neighborhood mm. uh, and a slum, a really, really just shitty part of town. Mm. Uh, so we were in the Mahala that was immediately north of there. And uh, this is a place that we'd been all the time. It was a market area. We had stopped to do... Um, we essentially would drive around and patrol, but also just show the flag, right? Yeah, sort yeah. of um, the idea that maybe we're stopping things from happening just by our presence. And so my squad leader at the time had got out of the truck and was escorted by a number of, uh, by by his driver and I think one of the other team leaders. And he's he's meeting the merchants, right? And so he's talking to the merchants through the interpreter. Right. And I was, my vehicle was always the rear security vehicle, so I'm at the very end of this, this, this four-vehicle convoy. And it was this beautiful day. It was uh, June 2007. Uh, really nice. Not super, super hot yet. Mm -hmm. And I just, it's one of those times where, you know, we'd already been there for 13 months, you know, and complacency is a huge huge massive problem there mm, mm -hmm. and I just didn't feel like being a dick that day right so I'm standing outside the truck which yeah maybe you shouldn't get out of the truck but I was always big about you know get out of the truck part of that showing my soldiers that I'm not afraid right yeah yeah and and pull security and so I'm hanging up on the right rear right front quarter panel of the truck and I remember waving to these kids that the the, the drive by their own car and they're waving and so I wave at them I'm being the nice American yeah right? right and I turn to the side I'm looking back towards the back of the Humvee and all of a sudden there's this sh massive impact on the side of my head just just wham and my initial thought was that somebody had uh, thrown a brick uh, you know, and it hit yeah. me inside the, the head with a brick and it's exactly what it felt like uh and this huge impact and my head spun to the left and there's a cloud of yellow feathers there, mm. right? And about that time, because I'm wearing these Peltor headphones, right? Which I bought myself and it's expensive, right? Um, Peltor headphones are electronic stereo headphones, right? So they have little microphones and they pick up what's around you and, and you can you can turn the volume way up, right? So which is very good for building clearing. It's so, like super hearing. Yeah. Yeah. We used to do it when we would do slow and deliberate clearing uh, in, uh, in SRT, right? Right. We're right. Moving very quietly through a house because it picks you're picking up everything, right? Uh, and what they do is, in the event of an explosion or a nearby gunshot, they turn off for a second, right? So then they act as protective, you know, as hearing protection. Mm. And then they'll turn back on again. And sometimes you'll get a sort of delayed, lower sound of whatever that, that sound was. Right. And so at that point, they come back on, and I hear the tail end of the shot. Um, I'm like, fuck, I've been, I'm hit, right? And I yell, I'm hit, I'm hit. And because I initially thought the impact came from the left, my left, right, the truck's right, I ran forward and back around the back hatch of the Humvee and jumped into the left rear passenger seat. Um, and I take my helmet off and uh, Cooper, my gunner, immediately popped smoke, which is exactly what I trained him to do. We took sniper fire throughout you know, smoke grenade. Now you're screening yourself from this. Mm. This is a whole truck mm -hmm. from yeah. yeah, right. And so he's he's behind the gun, 
looking, smoke's starting to billow. Nick's my driver turns around, and I take off my helmet, and the and the the headphones on the left side side fall apart, right? And and we're looking for 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 blood, you know, and we're looking for the bullet hole. And he's like, I don't see nothing. I don't see nothing. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. And then we realized that okay, whatever had happened is that I I, I wasn't hurt, right? You shot your helmet. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So about that time, my squad leader, Staff Sergeant Hume, comes running up to me at the door, and he's like, what happened? I was like, I got shot. He's like, are you hurt? I'm like, no. Uh, and and some, I don't know what he said then. Oh, I said, yeah. I said, let's go get the motherfuckers, yeah. right? Because <laughs> by now I figured out that the shot probably came from behind us. Yeah. And back there about a block away was a house where we'd had stuff happen before. Uh, we'd had a, um, one of the 82nd convoys, right, uh, infantry, Delta mm-hmm. Company, had been hit by an EFP, which is the most feared IED, uh, you know, had been hit in that place, and that had been about a month before, a month or two before. Yeah. So for some reason, I, I just instantly thought of that house, right? And he's like, no, we're getting out of here. And I, I was pissed, right? I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> And so I got out of the truck and ran back around to the driver's side stuff, jumped in the seat, and we pull away, and I opened the, the door, the Frag 5 door, and I leaned out and flipped up, you know, <laughs> um, fuck you, man, yeah, you know, yeah. just to show, because I'm sure that, you know, the, 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 the sniper, the spotter, if there was a camera guy, you know, they're still watching us. And I'll give them props because they were very disciplined. Yeah. It would be very tempting when I was running forward, you know, for the guy to have taken a second shot. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that he didn't shows that he was well trained, mm. right? The fact that they didn't even because it to, would have revealed him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, or had been the risk of it. Uh huh. Now, if they're good snipers, we probably wouldn't have noticed them anyway. And they could have been. They may well have been in the uh, a hollowed out trunk of a car. Yeah which was very popular, you know, if you remember the DC snipers, DC sniper got that stuff from insurgency tactics. Yeah, the guy was like laying in the in yep. in, in the, the the trunk of the car with a, yeah. with a, a hole drilled, drilled out. And and that stuff was very very common there. Uh, we had been we'd we'd seen cars and we'd been shown cars yeah. where they had done that. Or if he was inside a house and he knew how to do it, you know, it was very very easy and this was a problem when I was in Bosnia with snipers that would be um, hidden in buildings. Um, you know, the, the common thing is the movie with the sniper is that there's a guy leaning out the window with a rifle. Right? Sure. That's not the way Lee it Harvey works. Oswald style. Right. Yeah. It's not the way it works. <laughs> uh, if he's halfway smart, he'll be in the back of the room in an elevated position shooting down. And mm. if he's really, really smart, he'll be in the room behind the first room, right, with a single hollowed out brick. Mm. And he's sitting behind that, and he's taking that target acquisition through that through the first room, right through the window, and then like 300, 400, 500 meters or more, you know, down into down the street. You could have a high-powered rifle and a high-powered scope for that kind of thing. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, and you're working two-man teams. Yeah. Um, and the 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 marksman observer class that I had gone through to be a SWAT mo, mm-hmm. you know, utilize all these techniques. Right, and so I have no doubt that out there was, there was a guy, and I, I'll bet you he was Chechnyan. Yeah. Right, and I bet you that his spotter was Chechnyan, because a lot of those guys were making their way during the surge, during the insurgency, uh, to Baghdad. But he, he was certainly far better trained than any of the Iraqis were. Yeah, yeah. But the dumbass was off on the dope on his scope, the settings on his scope, because the funny thing is that there was another American soldier who got hit the same day I did. Right. Yeah. Down in Sadr City, there was an infantry guy that got shot in the head. Uh, Round had come from the side and had come into his ACH at the very back and had literally skimmed around the guy's cranium, which is very common, right? Yeah, right. Um, so if you think about it from the point of view of the sniper, his settings, you know, has the just impact of the bullet just a yeah, just mm. a, a couple of inches to the right, which is the same exact 
angle with me. So he also didn't change the settings on his rifle after he shot me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If indeed it's the same guy. And I'm willing to bet you it's the same guy. If, does that ever feel like God's hand to you or something? You know, does that ever, like, I, I think that would be an event that I would probably get stuck thinking about and i don't i mean yeah, we don't have do. a whole lot of time to go into the whole right. you know ptsd experience but but i wanted to, to 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 ask you i mean is that some is that is that the event that kind of for yeah. you for you was something that 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 skewed you off into a different direction you bet and and, and the problem is that it works in multiple ways is because one way you can take it is like ah you're invincible yeah <laughs> you have the light of god upon you you know i really am immortal right yeah. <laughs> right um the other way to take that is, holy fucking shit. Mm -hmm. They are, God is trying to tell me something, right? Mm -hmm. And when you put this on top of a whole ton of other experiences, and for instance, just a, a few months before that, we had been woken up out of bed by a direct fire rocket attack right into the side of our barracks, mm -hmm. right? We had just opened this combat outpost, combat outpost Callahan, uh, is, is fairly famous because of the things that have happened there. And if you, even now, if you look for, if you Google COP Callahan, right, you're going to pop up with some crazy, crazy stories. Mm. And the two biggest crazy stories out of it are two direct fire rocket attacks that were done on it. One, the first one was the one that I was in, where 6.30 in the morning, fast asleep in my cot, inside this single building that used to be a, a four-story um, ministry, old Ministry of Trade shopping center that was looted and gutted and burned during the, our initial evasion in 2003. Mm. And when we got to it, it was riddled with bullets and RPG spall heads and the basement had been flooded with, with diesel fuel and water and they pulled out dead bodies because they, you know, uh, death squads had dumped people there. And that, this, this is where we moved into. Yeah. And we moved into there with no running water, no, no sanitation, no power except for the talk, the tactical operations center and we we're literally surrounded in the middle of a neighborhood by people that are trying to kill us uh, and so what they had done is they had parked this little tiny bongo truck it's a little Korean truck with what looked like sugar bales filled with sugar bales but underneath it's a frame with somewhere around 20 or 30 uh, 120 millimeter rockets and this is outside the perimeter we didn't have any guard towers on the walls. We only had guards. You know, all the security was pulled from the top of the building mm -hmm. itself, which is a serious problem. Yeah. There's very little standoff distance beyond this, just the single T, you know, perimeter of T walls, concrete walls. And so Haji had gotten out of the van and walks off to the side. And the guys on the roof saw this happen, right? And they're like, but, you know, okay. The guy's <laughs> delivering sugar. Yeah. You know, what do you do? And then wham! All mm. this stuff fired at the same time straight inside of the building. Jesus. Yeah. So that had happened, you know, a couple months before. Uh, we had, you know, twice got knocked down by mortars, right? Physically knocked down by mm -hmm. mortars. Um, we had a RPG attacks on the building and yada, 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 you know. Uh, and on top of that, we were also losing people, not just casualties, but people were getting killed. And yeah. So, like, these names on my arm, right? Mm -hmm. Sergeant Brandon Parr. Sergeant Michael Peak, Sergeant Ashley Moyer, you know, was from my company. Mm. And they had been blown up by a massive buried IED that flipped the entire vehicle upside down, burned them all to death mm. because this is the armored vehicle. It's very hard to get into them. I hope and pray they were already dead, you know, just from the... Yeah, Im impact. Right. So yeah. that had happened. Um, Karen Clifton had been killed... And, and, and remember, two of these soldiers are women, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Karen Clifton had been killed on what's sometimes called the worst day in Baghdad, where, uh, same place actually, uh, a Bradley fighting vehicle had been hit by a massive IED, killed tons of people on that. And our guys went to, uh, w was QRF, Quick Reaction Force, and so pulled in to support them. And Karen's truck got hit by RPG-29, so it came in through her driver's side window, through her head, Aye. and then through the windshield, all of which is armored. Seriously injured the the, the gunner and the, the, the TC, who was a guy I knew well, staff sergeant man. So, uh, 
you know, Brad Schilling, who was the first guy that I knew that we lost, you know, we had lost him back in October. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was from Echo Company, first of the 125th Infantry, uh, who I worked with for about three months. So the whole thing had been getting really, really serious, right? Now we're now pe our people are getting killed. It feels like war. Yeah. 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 Um, but we were under this extremely restrictive ROE, Rules of Engagement. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> Which apparently only the military police were held to <laughs> held to the standard, right? <laughs> because we weren't just lighting up folks left and right. And yet, eighty second was the infantry guys were. Yeah, and part and part of my experience also was having was being called out to IP stations in the middle of the night to stand by while families came and picked up family members that had been killed by U.S. forces. Mm. And the elements that had killed these people, and in both cases wrongly right mm -hmm. because they were infantry guys doing traffic control uh tr tcps traffic checkpoints right? yeah which mps are supposed to run Seems like there are a lot of those types of like mistaken killings of civilians at those at those particular points you bet particularly if you don't run the tcp correctly particularly if you don't follow the rules of engagement well, that's a, that was the big blackwater intersection thing that, that yeah blackwater is a different deal because they they you know they had their own rules. Yeah, right. And, and actually, that's, I mean, that's exactly the whole thing, right? Is that you've got you've got yeah, diff but, different different kinds of warriors over there. Yeah, but let me tell you, particularly when we were at Fob Shield, which was at the Iraqi Ministry of the Interior, we were side by side Blackwater all the time mm. because they were esco escorting State Department folks from the IZ, you know, the, the Green Zone, across the river and to the Iraqi Ministry of the Interior, and so we used to see them. A lot. In fact, I wrote a book called uh, an article called "Rock Stars of Baghdad," mm. which I could read for you if you want. Mm. Uh, that was later on. There's a whole story there because Dan Laguna, who was a pilot for Blackwater, and he was retired uh, from the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, right? So was his brother, right? His brother flew. Both of them flew Little Bird helicopters for Blackwater insane pilots insane and they and so we would see them every day flying uh, protection when you say them. insane what do you mean really skilled or like yeah oh just insane. you want me to read you the article it's, <laughs> i mean i don't have time to read the whole okay. the whole article I, I, i'll post it on the blog about that uh, along with it. along with the episode and some of your stuff because you i mean you've told these stories in different formats i mean your your stuff was in a, a book by gary trudeau which is a yeah. The, the guy that, that does Dunesbury, I, I think a lot of people know that, obviously. But yeah. but um, what was that? What? Where, how did that come about? The funny thing is that when I got to Iraq, I right away once I got email access, I started doing sort um, what I would call sit reps. Yeah, sit rep is you know military acronym for situation report. Right. And I would send that back to my wife at the time and to family members. Yeah. And it was intended to be sort of a visceral experience written for non-military folks about what the combat experience was like. Mm. Um, and shortly after, and I started doing that in Kuwait during, during the train up that we did that. Mm -hmm. And then we moved into Iraq and we were in Balad and then we were in Bakuba and then we finally settled on Baghdad. And then even within Baghdad, we were moved between Fab Rustamaya and Fab Shield and then Combat Outpost Callahan. Fairly early on, I those sort of travel log sit reps became really interesting because mm. there wasn't a hell of a lot else to do. Yeah, and I was on U.S. Cavalry's. You know, U.S. Cavalry's quite large company that sells survival gear and military equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I noticed that they had a, a website called On Point where they would post combat stories. So I wrote to them and talked to a guy named David Danello, really, really great editor, and then later on, Professor uh, Andrew Lubin, who's still a good friend of mine. And so I started writing for them. And then I just happened one day to find Doomsbury.com's The Sandbox, which is, you know, on Slate. And they were doing the same thing. And so I would write some articles for U.S. Cavalry and then some articles for Doomsbury. And... Um, then really started focusing on Doomsbury mm. because they had the most, uh, more people were reading them, yeah. right? So they yeah. want to get the word out. 
And then I also wrote for U.S. Naval Institute for a while, and uh, they had the Gunge website, which also was doing combat stories. And then stuff started getting picked up by Military.com and some other mm. places. Um, so it, it took on a, a life of its own. And then in 2008, Gary put out the Sandbox, which was all of the best stories, best quotation mark stories yeah. from yeah. the website. And I was very fortunate. I had seven articles in that one. That's awesome. Uh, and we did a short book tour in, in D.C. And then a guy by the name of David Leventhal came out with a book called IED. And David had done a very funny book that was quite well received years ago, back in the late 60s, called uh, Hitler, Moves, Hitler Moves to the West. <laughs> and it was this funny thing where he had taken real-life military situations and then done these incredibly detailed dioramas with it. And so with IED, he did the same model take, you know, on the Iraq war, but with true stories in it. So my articles are in that. Cool. Uh, then I had an article in the New York Times where, uh, the, strangely enough, the Modern Love column had a competition. <laughs> and so I did this crazy story. It's still up on their website called May I Have This Dance. And it was about a series of dreams that I had at Combat Outpost Callahan about Natalie Portman. <laughs> Not in the usual soldier, you know, sexual sense, yeah. but of, of having a relationship with Natalie Portman, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes this relationship would go, would go bad and we would have breakups. <laughs> Sometimes it would be having dinner with her or dancing with her in a nightclub. And it was juxtaposing, for me, which clearly was a, a visualization of the sacred feminine mm. of innocence and purity mm -hmm. right uh, and and romance in, 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 in the real sense of Rome sure. being romantic and this was some strange Jungian um, extrapolation coming from the exact opposite which was my waking experience mm. which was this the, this incredibly brutal and, and, and increasingly personal combat experience in Baghdad uh, and then I was in Dan Laguna's book, um, You Have to Live Hard to Be Hard, which he took th that story, The Rock Stars of Baghdad, mm. uh, because I had described what he and, he and his brother were doing, right? And his brother had been shot down while I was there. I was only a few kilometers away at the time, sitting at this freaking IP station. Um, and I, you know, really idolize these guys because of the elan and esprit de corps that they demonstrated sure. through their flying. Yeah. And whenever those guys were overhead, you could not help, and this is a line from, this, from the article, you could not help but feel like you're in a really good action movie, <laughs> right? And how could you possibly lose because you're, you know, you're Delta Force, Special yeah, Forces. Yeah, and the and, good guys and, always win in those movies. Yes, yeah. and, the, and the funny thing, of course, is that the guys that worked for Blackwater, particularly with the with the helicopter yeah. element, really were. You know, they really are retired Delta Force guys, yeah, retired yeah. Special Forces guys. And so this is, there was this awesome blurring of combat fantasy and reality with them that also, you know, was literally brought back to Earth uh, like Daedalus, mm. you know, when Dan's brother was shot down. Mm. And so Dan was wrote that book with his wife Donna and they contacted me and said hey can we can we include this story uh, and, and I was like shoot I'm yes. absolutely, absolutely honored um, and actually when that story had come out it was funny because the president of Blackwater at the time had his executive assistant get hold of me and sent me this awesome box full of this is Eric Prince is this yeah. the air? <laughs> yeah <laughs> Had sent me this huge box of challenge coins and 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 hoodies and stickers, oh you know, my which God. I had then instantly passed out to everybody in the yeah, platoon. Right. You know, uh, and the funny thing is that when I retired, I actually applied to Blackwater. You know, now called well, now it's Academy. At the time, I think they were called Z. They keep changing. Yeah, yeah, name. they've had a lot of controversy around <laughs> around their tactics yeah. and the, and and even their relationship to the to the military uh, or to the U.S. military because of. I don't know. For for me, I think of like how, uh, um, even just like the the pay scale, you know, it, 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 the between a private military and a, and a and I guess publicly funded military, it seems like that would be a recipe for like a lot of tension between between U.S. soldiers and 
and and the 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 the, the private the private army over there, there, there the is, contractors. There is and there isn't. But what it really comes down to when you when you're the when you're the soldier of the marine and you're seeing these guys, you're like, yeah, dude, I want to go work for you. you yeah, know, I, I yeah. want to have a goatee and a mohawk and an M4, and I got want to be paid one hundred and twenty. There is kind of there is kind of <laughs> like a like a, a, a that's what's so weird about it, like a kind of counterculture to to that organization. I know I'm calling it Blackwater because that's what everyone knows it as, yeah. but it's, it hasn't been called Blackwater for many many years now um but yeah that whole fat that whole stuff stuff is fascinating to me and like you know we could we could go on forever i feel like i might have an owen owen powell part two uh yeah, but, but, awesome. but i gotta wrap it up for now i mean you've got like a really uh it sounds like a, a real kind of spiritual context for your experiences in war and like for a guy that for me that studies a lot of the vietnam war i mean there's there's a lot of that, you know, in in the military. That that I feel like the people that are in the military, whether it be the American military or any other, are closer to that door of, between life and death than yeah. a lot of other people. Yeah. And because because of the the, the kind of proximity uh, to that door, you're you're automatically going to have a more kind of uh, you know, for lack of a better word, spiritual kind of uh, um, attitude in life uh, and and a, and a, con you, a context and a, would, and a set of tools to understand you it. would hope so and actually one of the I, one of the things I put forward in objective rally point is this idea of warrior mystic therapy mm. right because part of the problem that we're facing right now and and, and part of the huge psych psychological issues mm. that veterans have you know after 12 years of war you yeah know, multiple deployments you know that's never happened before and we have the highest suicide rate of yep. uh, uh, at and, any time in the military and right i would now. suggest that the reason for that mm -hmm. is because the spiritual consciousness within america mm -hmm. right does mm -hmm. not exist in a healthy way for veterans and mm -hmm. if we look at the past if we look at particularly the greeks mm -hmm. right or if we look you know with the spartans you know if you look at Nordic mythology, right, with Thor. If you look at the Celtic idea of the warrior mystic, right? If you look at the Amazonian, particularly within the Ayahuascan, mm -hmm. uh, shamanistic tradition, mm -hmm. you know, where the indigenous hunter, people warrior, in the U.S., mystic, yeah. Yeah, all of that in stuff the Americas. suggests that you can have those experiences and you can incorporate them into a spiritual conscious uh, narrative, right. right, that makes sense, that puts everything in perspective. But here in the U.S. particularly, that does not exist. Mm. Instead, what we get is a two-dimensional warrior, right, that does nothing, that, that does not serve us when we come home and we start processing these It's a giant process of denial is what we have about, about war in the U.S., and, that, and that's partially, in, uh, well, almost entirely because the, that denial serves elites. And, and that yep. denial of what, what the, the real cost of war is, and, um, is is hidden for from us for a reason. They don't they don't think yep. the public is able to handle it. The um, public cannot handle it. Yeah, and and so, yeah, it's a big story, and it, and it's one that that I think you know right now people are talking about sui suicide a lot because a, a bill, a suicide prevention bill, was just was just blocked by a leading Republican in Congress. Yeah, and I mean that's not surprising to anybody because the system has been fucked up for a long time over these issues. But it's still something that I think that you know obviously we're going to have to deal with at some point. Well, here's here's the bigger issue. I know I know we got to. We got to close this, mm -hmm. but just something to think about maybe yeah. for next time. Yeah, the primary issue is not veterans committing suicide. Mm -hmm. As horrible as that is, mm -hmm. the real thing, and, and I'm glad you brought up the the, the power elite. Mm -hmm. Right, the real thing that they need to be aware of is that right now, the far left, not even the far left, right, the left is pissed, mm -hmm. right, because we feel that our civil liberties are being taken away, and the right is pissed mm -hmm. for exactly the same reason. And what they've got is hundreds of thousands, quite possibly after 12 years, over a million highly trained, <laughs> highly traumatized veterans, right? Mm -hmm. Who know firsthand how to run an insurgency because yeah. we experience the brunt of the insurgency. Mm. So, you know, the heavy handed police reaction that we saw, for, for instance, in Ferguson, yeah. you know, never, never yeah. mind, you know, the, the stuff at the root of that, but the, the cops in these countries who've not been to war, who feel invincible when they're wearing their body armor and everything else, have no idea of just how vulnerable they really are. And that million man, you know, million man and woman veteran force, yeah. right, is increasingly being pushed towards revolution, mm. right? 
I, well, I, I would love to see a Heinlein style Starship Trooper scenario, <laughs> not the movie, the book. You right? know, this scenario where, has come up on the, this podcast before. Yeah, where the, the veterans yeah. seize control, you know? Uh, and, and, and it sounds I think it's it, it sounds so comic booky to some people and so like out of left field but at the same time to me you know when I think about um, and when I, I, I engage in these issues it, it, it starts to feel like a, 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 a realistic scenario and I don't know if that's true or not um, but at the same time it's we are I think you're right and we will wrap up here but we are you know we are building whatever we're doing and whatever direction the country is going right now we are building uh, a recipe for 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 massive change in, in one way or another and that that that's exciting and exhilarating and scary to live through uh owen powell thanks <laughs> thanks so much for joining <laughs> Thank me you, i appreciate man. it appreciate it mm -hmm.